You're watching The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG, an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. If you like what you see, please consider pledging to our Patreon to support the show and get access to a patron-only after-show, early podcast episodes, GM notes, character sheets, and even the chance for your tabletop OC to cameo in our series. Thank you so much for watching, and enjoy! The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for this episode include romance, kissing, flirting, complex and complicated relationships, grief, trauma, death of loved ones, descriptions of food, dark and unknowable depths, megalophobia, body horror, possession, compulsion, manipulation, environmental destruction, and fire. Arc 1, Episode 28, Mend What's Fraught, from Self-Eulogy of a Martyr by Connie Chong. Kissing the Chosen One is an act of worship. They are warm, they are soft, they are firm and steady as the roots of a mountain, they are free and thrilling as a diving hawk. They smell like cherry blossoms, rain. Jasmine, soil, incense, holy things being burned, everything, everything. Time slows around the two of you, folding its arms around your lover's embrace, keeping this moment seared into your memory forever. Sing's arms wrap around your waist. Her mane of snow-white hair tickles your cheeks. Her antlers cast a gentle shadow over your face. Kissing Sing is everything you've ever wanted it to be, and so much more. Lumira, you are not the chosen one, but here in this moment, haloed by their touch, you understand what it means to be fated. This feels right. This feels so tremendously easy. This kiss is your destiny. And then time starts to move again, traitorously, beautifully, and Sing's pink eyes flutter open against your cheeks. She smiles down at you and they whisper against your mouth. Good morning, Lumira. Lumira can't help herself. She reaches up to press another chaste kiss to the top lip, top lip of Sing. Good morning. And on that, we pan across Storm Chaser in a swirl of cherry blossoms and clockwork gears to find Zynan. Zynan, what private and enclosed space upon this ship have you sequestered yourself in, and what are you doing? Zynan is in his room, um, still kind of mid-morning routine. He has his shirt and the sling that he uses to wear his rifle on but not his many layers of clothing over it or the rifle itself which is leaned very neatly next to his bed he hesitates before summoning the oracle <laughs> there is a familiar swirl of lights and sound and the tense and the tensing of magic as whoosh, this orb whistles into existence next to your head. Hello, Zaynanesh. How can I help you? Uh, I need to I need to get a hold of someone, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Who might it be? I need to speak with Naeem again. Oh. Okay, I'm just gonna preemptively put myself on deafen for this. Uh, and there's a beep, 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 as the oracle flashes a bunch of different colors with every pulse. And then a boom, 
as the call is picked up. And a holographic projection triangulates outside of the oracle, forming a screen in front of your face. As you see Naeem, he is not mid-mission, he's back at trans. You recognize actually their office, their study, with a desk in front of them, papers strewn about in organized chaos, and bookshelves packed with scrolls, slates, and tomes of all kinds and backgrounds behind them. They have several different pieces of sutra paper floating in midair around them, and different kinds of writing implements going all at the same time. They look to be in the middle of some rigorous study. Oh, Zainan. Hi. What can I help you with? I see you're done with your Mayday mission. Yes, we came back not half a day ago. Good. Uh, I hope it went well. It did. We completed our objective. How can I help you, Zainan? Right. Uh, listen, Naeem, uh, I'm... I'm oh. I'm not good at this, but I, I am sorry about before, about the last time we spoke. Naeem pauses and then looks at you through the holographic feed for the first time, really. There's still a flush, I think, in your face from crying and a kind of, well, you tell me, Zainan, what does Naeem see? Naeem is one of the very few people in all of the journey that can look at Zainan Esh and read him like a bold-faced book written for preschoolers. And uh, on him is... There's a crack in the veneer that has kept Zainan from being the person that Naeem has wanted him to be. There is a tiredness from the vulnerability um, and there's fear underneath all of that. Mm. Not just um, fear of the vulnerability. I think more importantly, Zainan tends to be able to handle most situations and he is feeling the tension in the air like the electricity in the engine room just it is holding on to him N never mind our previous conversation i hope things have been well on your end how is lumira lumira has been um remarkable she is she is a credit to everyone who has ever trained her or worked beside her. I'm glad you agree. And the rest of your team? Working with twins is wonderful, actually. Um, but we are we are coming to uh, something of a crescendo. And I'd never really thought through being next to the chosen one of fate about the scope of things and, and we're, we're facing things that I feel like are more powerful than me. You're not alone in that feeling, Zainan. This Mayday protocol, these Mayday missions, they are not like what we have been used to doing. This isn't just moving a flower pot two feet to the left because of fate's will. This is, the stakes are higher, Zainan. I, I've only been back just a little over half a day and I haven't seen therapeutics and recovery so busy. There have been people with broken limbs, shattered souls even. No deaths, Good. but a lot of casualties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't expecting to be in a world that, well, uh, I feel like 
fate has had her turn at this world once. Makes me wonder if that's not uh, why we're back again. Said it right. It's as fate said during her pronouncement at the beginning of all of this. The journey is changing. Oblivion's shadowy claws are finally starting to release from the throat of the universe. Things are different now. Yeah. Everyone at Trans can feel it. Oblivion. And I feel like every time Zynan has said the name Oblivion near Naeem, there has been an edge of anger. Mm -hmm. uh, something that normally is the fire that ignites Zynan. And this, he's rolling around a significantly deeper thought about what he offhandedly mentioned. Mm -hmm. That fate has touched this world before. And he is concerned. Not about oblivion. And for the very first time, about fate. About fate's role in this world. Are you doubting, Zynan? No. no uh... That look, I don't think I've ever seen it on your face before. Doubt. Zynan, what's going on? I've never... You know, we don't do these long missions very often, so maybe this is normal, but... The Twilight Guard has been here before. And... and... They... To your assigned plane? Yeah. That's not so unusual. The Twilight Guard has been to a lot of places, doing a lot of things. Yeah. They, uh... So this, this, this plane, not to get, of course, uh, outside of what I should be telling you, but, uh... A calamity stopped a calamity here. Calamity stopped a calamity. Yeah. And how does the Twilight Guard factor into this? They triggered one of those calamities. <sighs> then it is her will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right. <sighs> uh, and yet you I still... Think doubt, Zynan. There is still fear. Not fear about Oblivion. Not rage at Oblivion. Zynan, level with me. What's going on? I just always thought that destruction on that scale was... Well, there was a different name for it. A different name. Yeah. Oblivion. Well... No matter how much good it's done, it's, it was violent. The path of the journey isn't always non-violent. You're aware of this. This is what we signed yeah. up for when we became agents of the Syndicate. If you have found traces of the Twilight Guard triggering this calamity in order to stop another one, I am sure it is by her design. These May Day missions, they are to rectify Oblivion's mistakes. The plane I went to was devastated as well. Quite different from yours, I reckon, but similar. It contained traces of Oblivion as well. Devastation calamities all across the realm. We were able to help the people there set things right. The path of fate isn't always easy, Zynan. That's why we have to trust in her will. You're right. And, uh, thank you. And, you uh, are welcome. Zynan, I know 
you'll come back with everyone on your strike team. Safe and sound. Because you might be full of shit sometimes. <laughs> Especially at LSSG. But you are a damn good leader. A damn good mentor. A damn good friend when you try. And it seems like you are trying. Genuinely. This time. Look, I don't know what compelled you to call me up, but I've... You... And Naeem trails off, slightly frustrated, slightly embarrassed. And Zainan, you know. You know that when you crack open that wall for a sliver and show your true tender heart, genuine vulnerability, Naeem cannot refuse you. Honestly, I... I think I just needed to hear your voice. Hmm. <laughs> well, when you come back to trans, safe and sound, maybe you can tell me about this... all of this over breakfast. Perhaps, like we used to. Okay, but I'm making it. <laughs> Fine by me. I know. I'd love that. I'm... I'm gonna try. Uh, really. <laughs> for some reason, Zainan, for some damn reason, this time, I feel like I can believe you. I hope so. Ugh. Doing my best. <laughs> yeah, well, don't fuck it up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll try. That one, too. <sighs> Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we should be back soon, I hope. Good. I'll keep a seat at the breakfast table open for you. Good. Well, I should, um, I should continue filing these sutras. They have people they need to go to, and I assume you're busy as well. Yep, gotta go back to being a wild sailor on a ocean of trees. I will <laughs> talk to you when we come back. Yes, talk to you later, Zai. Bye, name. <laughs> Time passes aboard Storm Chaser. The ship bears down on ever thicker, ever thornier waves. The runners hum, the light dims. As evening lengthens into night, all of you can sense your journey's end coming ever closer. The world tree isn't far now. Even those who aren't Amergen can feel it. This part of the old growth wood is the most ancient part of the wild sea any of you have ever traversed, and the vegetation whispers of eras long subsumed. As Storm Chaser continues toward her final destination, we push back down through the slats to find Sayer. Sayer, at this point, Obviously, you are fully awake, you have been completely recovered, and your joints should be a little stiff, but they're not. Your head should be ringing from the impact of falling, but your thoughts are loud and clear in your own mind. Lumira is the best healer you've ever known, but she must have done a really good job with you this time. As you get used to being back in your body and still reeling from that conversation you had with Amargen, where do we find you? Sayer ran from that conversation with Amarjan. There's a coiling, a writhing that he, he's physically okay, and he paces around a, a storeroom here on Storm Chaser, where we keep dry foods and rations. This little window that showcases the lights of the outside 
and he is just pacing in the shadow in the slitted moonlight that he gets in here because as he's feeling better physically than he's ever been but his insides his mind his inner world feels so wrong it feels like holding on to something that's waiting raring to release and he's just pacing and gripping onto his trousers pacing gripping onto the hills of his crescent blade pacing grabbing onto fistfuls of his hair as he thinks about the burning path mm. seeing the end and fear you You pace in the storeroom, grabbing at your hair, your clothes, blinking hard, thinking your mind subsumed by these thoughts, and then unbidden, butting in thoughts of what Amergen said to Lumira about Sing Lumira, Sing Amergen, Aregnus, all of these thoughts swirling through your mind. And then you hear footsteps coming down this corridor, familiar footsteps. You would recognize them even if you had no access to sound, even if every single one of your senses were cut off and divorced from your soul, your sister's footsteps coming down the corridor, pausing in front of the storeroom, and then a knock. Sayer, are you in the storeroom? Sing? And he says Can I come that in? so close. He says that so clumsily. He wasn't expecting this, but he knows that knock. He knows those steps. And piercing into the middle of his mind is Sing and the mirror and what may or may not have gone on above deck, what may or may not come, and then a fear and then the burning path. And he says, yeah, I'm here. I just need a moment to think. Sorry. I, okay, uh, can I come in? I'm coming in. And Singh just opens the door and enters. She is glowing, metaphorically, mostly. Her eyes are bright, her lips are a little swollen, their cheeks are flushed, their hair and robes are flowing in an unfelt, unblowing wind. Their bright, fateful, scintillating gaze falls upon you, Sayer. And there are piles of cherry blossoms on the ground where she walks like pink snow left in her wake. She is very, very, very happy and excited. Sayer, sorry to interrupt, but I'm so glad you're okay. Lumi said you'd be awake by now. Yeah, I'm awake. And he Good. says that with such bitterness and he just looks at how bright they shine it hurts to look at them it hurts to be here with them sing pauses she registers the look on your face even though she's clearly on some kind of joyful buoyant momentum sayer i hmm and she closes the door behind her, and she's still glowing, but she looks concerned, and in a way like she wants to connect with you, which perhaps just makes all of this worse for you. Sayer, I, I wanted to talk to you about everything. And Sayer doesn't hear that. Sayer is so focused on the piles of cherry blossoms, the, the glow, the scintillating light, the gorgeous feeling of being chosen, of being loved, loved, not doubted and loved. And he doesn't hear sing and thorns bloom at the base of his horns, his antlers where the cherry blossoms should be. And he says, look, I don't want to talk right now. We have a mission. Leave me alone. Yeah, yes, the mission, but this is only going to take like two seconds and it's important. And I would and like to wait. talk with you. I Just leave me be, sing. 
and Sayer says that as he like approaches her, they're standing shoulder to shoulder, and he takes the knob of the door in his hands, turns it, pulls it towards him, and walks past the threshold of the door. Back turned. Uh, Sayer! Something really hurts when she calls up after him. And it feels like a door has shut. But there's a mission we have. And there's an omen that needs to be released. And he moves back above board. So clawing at his insides. The sensation of the door shutting coincides with another sensation so subtle between the two of you that in both of your hurt at each other, your shut offness, your standoffishness, Sayer, neither of you quite register it at that moment, but it is the distinct feeling of a red thread being severed. We pan across Storm Chaser now following the fragrant smell of something cooking. Zynan, what are you making on deck? And are you succeeding at it? Zynan has become quite resourceful with cooking here on the Wild Sea because like every new plane, there's slightly different ingredients. But at the end of the day, vegetables fall under like maybe six categories. And he's started to really like parse out which ones maybe shouldn't be eaten uh, and has been trying to gather information like salting the seeds and things like that. And, and so he has been taking all of this knowledge, but more interesting to him than how this is turning out because he's an okay cook. He thinks he's okay, but he is more interested in his company. Lumira is covered in flour. I mean, head to toe covered in flour. She is wickedly cussing under her breath as she is desperately trying to whip the egg yolk that you taught her and it is just it's not forming stiff peaks and she is not happy um i think after probably a little bit of time she just kind of throws the whisk into the bowl and it's like sign in i there are a few things in this world i am called to do this is not one of them however yeah. she is very bright and glowing and that same sense of sing just very bright and like bouncing on her heels but she's also extremely frustrated right now <clears throat> it just won't whip right zainan it takes time the thing about cooking is that you're giving sure people with something to eat but it's also time and care and patience i'm sorry i think you are confused just because i carry a pocket watch does not mean i have time <laughs> yeah yeah you're right you're right i can finish this uh and <laughs> she just tries to dust herself off as best as possible and is just like I will check on the biscuits in the oven and goes over to the oven like slams it down to check on them they're not completely done so they fall a little bit so she just cusses again and slams the oven shut and like sits 
at the edge of the table and like crosses her legs, arms crossed, pouting like a 12 year old. <laughs> Zainan in that amount of time has scooped up the bowl and the whisk and just is walking over. He's dusted in some flour, but he's always dusted in something. So it just kind of blends in with everything else. And he sits down next to her quietly. You, Say uh, it. You want to talk about it? I know that you said trying to find a hobby to deal with things is a good idea, but do we have to try cooking? Maybe cooking isn't for you. It's fine. There's but... nothing I touch that is not for me. Oh, it just right. doesn't work right. There's something wrong with the kitchen. Sure, yeah, it's the kitchen. Um, but don't, don't patronize me. I, Lumira, I can't help but notice you're a little on edge. And she like flicks her hair over her shoulder. I am not on edge. What are you talking about? So, uh, hearing that the Twilight Guard has been here, that the uh, Ashen Leviathan is bearing down on us, and uh, we're being followed by someone that looks like his soul has been drained from his eyes. That's not what's bothering you? What was that? Oh, I think it's the timer. Let me go check on the bacon. And walks over to the kitchen, completely ignoring what you said. Uh-huh. You know, it's all right to uh, be a little imperfect. I mean, for the cooking, of course. When you say imperfect, the look on her face could cut a diamond in half. It is. <laughs> there is nothing that I don't touch, that I don't learn and master to the nth of its degree. It is only a matter of time before this, and she points to the just downtrodden egg whites, just, just down calamitous. This is nothing but science. And as soon as I figure that out, everyone, including myself and you, will be so glad that I mastered it. I'm, sh I'm sure I will be. Uh, it took me a long time to get the hang of cooking, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a brilliant science person. Yeah, you just grew up doing this. Yeah, I did. And I'm happy to help. If I need your help, I will ask for it. And then she walks back over to the egg whites and tries to whip it again furiously for a few minutes before she gives up and steps back. Pop, pop, I need your help. Yes, Lamira. They won't stiffen. And she just pushes the bowl over in your direction. And Zainan looks at the bowl, slides it to the side a little bit, and looks at Lumira. Why don't we just leave the cooking for a minute? Please. And she <laughs> just dusts herself off as best as possible, walks away from the bowl. You, uh... What has you so wound tight? Things seem to be going pretty all right. <clears throat> and Lumira sits down and crosses their legs and then uncrosses them and crosses them again opposite side and fidgets quite for a little bit of time. <clears throat> I 
permission to speak freely. You always have it. She rolls her eyes at that, but graciously accepts. I'm going to ask you a question, and I don't want you to deem it as weird or read into it because I know you love to do that. Uh, I will not do that. And she kind of sits back and ruminates on it for a bit. Trying, you could tell she's trying to find words, but failing miserably. As she does, Zynan's footsteps very slowly and purposely move towards her, that hard sole of his boot echoing off of the Broadwood. Say you have feelings for someone and you acted, which may have possibly been precocious and impulsive and maybe not thinking completely all the way through and now you are scared within your wit's mind and let's just also say by chance that that person actually works with you you work together consistently she's not making eye contact with you at all she's looking space out in the opposite side of the kitchen How do you handle it? Zynan has knit his fingers together and is just standing squared up to Lumira and she cannot see the smile on his face, but it is present. You do it carefully, and I say out of experience, but life's too short to not chase what you want, Lumira. That's what Amarjan said, but Amarjan also is not the best example of that. You've seen her and Abasi. They are sad, to say but the least. They are in a world that is dangling on the edge. And you see, as he says this, there is an honesty. Even if you're not looking, he holds those words so tightly. All you can do in those moments is chase what you have. And hold it as tight as you can. What happens if that changes the dynamic of everything? Do you want it? Between us, yes. Everyone else, no. You chase it. You chase it and you don't let go. And behind those words is the echoes of all of the fears that he has had about the Wild Sea burning down, about the Baron, about this change with the Mayday Protocols and buried beneath a mountain of dust is a heartache that he has not said, but is always there. I think Lumira sits in that there, her and Zynan's relationship has always been something like this, where they get each other without having to get each other and she nods life is indeed too short pop pop and she winks and grins Zainan smiles and he knows obviously but there is almost a longing to be in Lumira's shoes in this moment, to go on this ride, to strap yourself to a hang glider and jump. And so he just grins back.
Well, I think that might burn and I need to get cleaned up. And yep. Lumira stands up and attempts to dust herself off. Uh, she has on this frilly corny ass apron that like gets tangled in her hair as she's trying to like pull the neck part over herself I'm going to shower thank you and sign in hmm. I trust this stays between us I'm not even gonna tell these floorboards or the bacon I'm gonna Keep it in for an extra two minutes. I like mine crispy. And she's going to leave out and attempt and like go over to clean herself. Yeah. Lumira, as you exit, um, <laughs> Su Hyun, who has been standing there for who knows how long, uh, <laughs> approaches the table where you remain, Zainan, with two, two bowls on a tray. I, while the two of you were talking, I made dried pollock soup simmered with soybean sprouts and tofu in a flavorful stock. I saw you were making breakfast foods. I decided to help the atrocities. Huh. Perfect. Thank you. This will actually go very well with the, the mostly perfect biscuits. You are very welcome. And Su Hyun sets it down. And on the tray, going down on the breakfast table, we pan back across Storm Chaser as we watch the light drain more and more from the sky and as time continues to turn onward. Later that night, when the leaves have swallowed the sun and the twin moons are just beginning to rise, Storm Chaser reaches the world tree. Origin is the first to feel its presence, but the rest of you sense it within moments. A massive, overwhelming, sightless, soundless, tasteless aura that radiates from deep within the old growth wood. It feels like gravity. It feels like fate. Strike Team Nova. You reconvene on the deck of Storm Chaser alongside the Scions. All of you see, bathed in pale moon's light, a massive ocean of bright green leaves taking over the bare branches and stripped roots of the old growth wood. It stretches from horizon to horizon, blanketing the world in front of your eyes, as vibrant as the verdancy you all left behind in the Raya, in Siren Song. It's like the world has gasped back to life here, at the end of everything. Or is it the center of everything? Or is it the beginning and the end? As all of you gaze upon this ocean of pure, breathless green, we focus on Omergen. That bright, urgent feeling inside your chest is stronger than it's ever been. You know what you need to do. You must dock Storm Chaser here and proceed down. Into the thrash, the tangle, the sink, the drown, the darkness under eaves itself, to the bottom of the wild sea, and commune with its heart. To commune with the wild sea's heart. What do you say to your gathered allies and friends as you prepare to face your destiny? Well, everybody, we have made it to where we needed to get to. The next part is up to me. I just have to go down into the deepest parts of the wild sea that saved my mother no one alive has ever been into. And from there, I will do what must be done. Why the hell are you talking like you're going down there by yourself? Yeah. Because I plan on going down there by myself. Absolutely oh. not. Lumira will step forward and open up the book that she carries that's attached to her hip right next to the pocket watch that you see her consistently wearing or fiddling with. And she'll open to the halfway through the book almost and pull out 
a flower. This is the same flower that the gardener gave to her in the healing garden back when the Raya burned. This was a gift to me, but I was told it allows me to speak to the plants of the under the wild sea. There is no way I'm letting you down there alone. Yes, you are the princess, but even a princess needs backup. I appreciate your support, Mira. I'm glad we were on a different foot now, but... Hmm. And she kind of, like, pulls you closer. Listen. I don't want to take your other friend with me, and I look at Sierra over your shoulder, and I trust you to keep an eye on them. You're the best healer around, right? Correct. If the Baron does try something, I imagine... I imagine a lot of people could get hurt if those two start fighting. So I need you here to make sure everyone gets out of here alive. I'm asking you as a friend, not the princess. Lumira was sitting on that and ruminating for a bit until you added that last part. She will nod, close her book, set it back into her robes, and step back, line in line with Strike Team Nova. Excuse me, Strike Team Nova. Does anyone else have some sort of objection I need to deal with? Yes, actually. And yes. Sinon steps forward. Usually he's happy to stand in place and lecture at people, but he motions to the ship itself. I don't know what ritual or purpose there is to go in alone, but your mother offered us this ship so that we could help you. Whether that is bring you back, I think she just wants you home. And I will help bring you home, even if that means going down with you. I'm sure you have your own people to get home to, and I can't promise that'll happen if you go with me. I'm not asking. I'm telling you, on behalf of the mission that I was sent on by Queen Hylian Mylesia, no offense. Fine, you've been the most agreeable one so far, so... No offense, Lumira. Lumira's sitting there, and she really was like... <laughs> like shrugging catching like uh, literally catching <laughs> strays like see what i even do i didn't even do nothing and now my name is getting pulled into it um she just nods none taken sing steps forward princess our group strike team nova we are something of a package deal so if zainan's going all of us is going i refuse to let any members of my team go down Without all the me pieces, next to them. all the pieces are in place. Lumira looks over at Sierra. <laughs> 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 I love how it's a record scratch, and all of us are like, <laughs> "Um, you good?" Yes, I'm sorry. That was rather cryptic. Lumira will walk over to Sayer. Are you okay? It's just a feeling. And you see it. That serpent again. On that eye, like a violent scar. I can feel it. The end is close. All of you I are right. I am worried about you. Something glitches and shifts in Sayer. It looks... You've never seen Sayer like this. 
any pain, any wound he carries, he carries it with courage. He carries it without issue. He's never worn his wounds like a burden to you or anyone else in the strike team, but today it's different tonight. It's different. The wall is gone. He can't. This something wrong. Are you still in pain? Just a mild discomfort. The faster we end this, the better. The faster this goes away. I can, and she reaches into her pocket to find her poultice, her gum, that consistent stabilizer that she uses in her healing. If, if you, you need to sit this out. If you allow him, he places a hand so close to yours, but it doesn't touch. There's something that stops him. No, I'm fine. We're doing this together. All of us. We must. And it looks like he Sears wants to right. say something else. But he stops. Zaiden locks eyes with Amargen. Pleading for her to let this pass. She doesn't. <laughs> Amargen <laughs> walks up walks up to Sierra. And puts a hand, like, again, interpersonal, but puts a hand, like, over, like, close to your chest. Doesn't put a hand all the way in your chest. And then points at a finger. Listen to me. And looks you in the eye. I have meant what I said the other day. Whatever darkness you have going on, you need to get it in check. Because it's not you, and it isn't what you need. I know that look, and you think you need whatever this is to feel important. If you want to come down there with us, I need to know we can trust you. Because starting with all the pieces are in place does not really help your case. That I looks at you curiously like a dancing cobra. You're right. I don't need this. But I am a member of my strike team, and I'm here to do my duty as I promised you, Princess. Let me do my duty. What I've promised my allies and Sayer's blue eye rests on Zynan. Zynan catches it, and there is that connection sitting under the moons, talking about pursuing what you want and how to hunt. And he nods at you. And Zynan just one nod, very curt, but very certain, nods back. As I, the sentiment remains, I'm not going anywhere. As I walk back up to the gaggle, I do stop by Zainan. Keep an eye on your team. Always do. And then to Abasi, keep an eye on your bro. I will, Amarjun. Sayer. Glad you're up and walking. I promised Amarjin that you were good, okay? And I know that you wouldn't make me break my promise. There's a tiny hitch in his throat. Lumira, you hear it. You've heard it before. And he just nods, unable to speak like a puppet on a string. See? He's good. Great. Perfect. Well, 
I'm sure if they're all going, you two will also want to go, uh, I say to the other scion, so... <sighs> Just... There's one ground rule down there. Up here, um, some of you, when I gesture at uh, Lumera <laughs> and Seer, have enjoyed tit for tat with me. That will not be happening down there, do you understand me? If myself or the other scions tell you to do something, you need to do it. Abasi's just crossing her arms, like puffing her chest up next to Amrjan as Amrjan says that, and is like nodding and punctuating it with a, yeah, that's right. Listen to us. I, Listen to them. Lumira looks so utterly disgusted with someone other than Artemis giving her direct instructions, but she swallows it down because she knows she has a mission. So I think to counter that, Lumira is mimicking Abasi's stance, but instead she's leaning towards Sing. Kind of like, yeah, and this is my team. What's up? Like a challenging it, but also not directly going against what Amarjan is saying. I know everybody thinks they know what is best, but, and I cannot stress this enough, we, and I just the science, are literally what makes up the wild sea. And we are well, here to support you. Thank you. So when I say you need to listen to us, I don't mean it as you are lower than us. I mean, we are connected to this place we all call home in a way that other people just aren't. I don't want anything to happen to any of you down there. It would be on my hands. You won't get any pushback from me. <sighs> and Suhyon. Suhyon rests a hand on your shoulder, uh, Amarjan. Not just on your hands, Amarjan. This is in all of our hands. All of the Scions. Abasi and I both obviously know that you are the Scion of soul and heart, but you are not alone. You might be the soul of the Wild Sea, but I am its mind and Abasi is its body. We are stronger together and Suhyan addresses all of you at this, then we are apart, and whatever differences we might have, and their eyes linger on Seir, I hope that those will pale in comparison with the shared goal and the strengths that bind us. Thank you, my friend. Of course. I may not be a scion, but I do understand, appreciate, and fight for life. So, you say chum? And she bites at this next sentence a little bit. I say how high. Hmm. That was hard for you, I like that. She rolls her eyes. Like, you see the whites of her pupils. She rolls her eyes so hard. I'm glad to see all of you getting along by now. The Baron's ship has pulled up parallel next to Storm Chaser. Out of the mist, it seems like a thick fog peels away to reveal his presence only at that moment, shielded up until that point. None of you are exactly how long, none of you are exactly certain how long he's been standing there and how much he's overheard. Now, Princess, are you ready to lead us all down to your destiny? Yes. Um, Baron, since you have helped guide me so far, I would like for you to be at the front with me. Of course, whatever you say, my princess. Everybody else, buddy up. Um, and I give a bossy, like, the look, like, and you're behind <laughs> us. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> shotgun. I call shotgun. That's second in line. Sayer. 
and mm. jerks her head at the same time as Sing was starting to open her mouth and gesture towards Sayer. Uh, Sayer seemed caught by the voice of the Baron. Out of a curiosity, that's the first, second time he's heard that voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he sees Abasi and does not see Sing. He senses her, but there's a distortion. And there's a writhing that's so loud in his body, he just snaps his head over to Abasi and goes, I'll come with you. Excellent. All right, let's get going. All and right, on that, old man, I guess it's us. You, me, and these two, and he nods to the print and sing. We'll be fine. And on that, your party makes your final preparations. You drop Storm Chaser's anchor, quite literally, in Sayer's case. You gather your belongings. You strap Actually, on weapons. Yes? Sayer uncharacteristically walks to the button stop it calculatedly oh my god it and watches it drop and it's cold just almost like an automaton just lets it go and then walks with determination procedure towards the strike team Val, that is the most unnerving thing you've ever had to say. I don't to. like it. I mean, th there's been a lot of shit you said, but that one really shook me to the oh, core. Oh, don't worry. It's my bro. You can, everyone, you can, we can trust it. We got a bro in here. question. Yeah. We, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I, uh, yeah, he's super cool. He's so chill. Uh, the my pieces dog doesn't are bite. in place. The dog. <laughs> the pieces are in place. He doesn't <laughs> bite people. Don't worry about it. Anyway, Sorry. have stuff to do, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry I have a tummy ache while I'm doing all this. I'm being very brave about it. <laughs> You're so brave, Val. You're one of our strongest It's warriors. all that dark oil you ate. What? What? Don't worry about it. Don't eat. Don't do that, folks. Take care of your tummy. We do not condone eating or drinking crude oil on <laughs> Translator RPG. Let it be known. Got it! Anyway, <laughs> we do not endorse that. <laughs> Continuing onward, <laughs> your party straps on weapons, equipment, provisions, medkits. And without another word, as you get ready, all of you begin to descend. The thrash is the easiest part to get through. It's vibrant, it's green, it's full of sturdy branches and pliant bark for you to plant your hands and feet onto. After a few hundred feet of climbing down, the tangle rises to greet you. It's thicker than the thrash, full of vines and thorns. You have to carefully place your limbs or risk snagging your pack, your hair, your clothes, even your skin on some sharp protruding plant. Darkness begins to press in at this stage. Sing's glowing longsword lights your path alongside a jar of shaken glowworms strapped to Abasi's waist by the front. The prince's hands at the back are lit bright, bright blue, resonating a similar hue as Amarjan's curious indigo tattoos. As your party carefully navigates the thorns and vines of the tangle, you eventually reach the sink. Zainan, this layer of the Wild Sea is similar to the one you encountered. It is old. Old beyond belief, the vegetation around you stretching past centuries into millennia. You travel down branches the size of buildings. Sheets of moss pour from holes as big as football stadiums that liken themselves the width and length of massive waterfalls. The deeper you go, the bigger and wider and more spaced out everything gets until you reach the drown. This entire time, Amargen has been leading your party down the wild sea at a slight but perceptible 
angle. You're not going straight down like a drill. You're traveling toward something. Something hidden. Buried. Something that's always been here and shall always remain. Fate willing. Your party passes through a curtain of hanging moss, walking on a branch that could easily hold all of you if you stood shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. And you see it. The world tree. It is the largest tree in the entire wild sea. Its trunk is the width of a city. It rises in front of your eyes as an unending, infinite wall of bark. Every whorl the size of a city block. Its branches are endless and huge and extend into the darkness from all sides. And you realize you're standing on one of the branches and that the trees you've been passing this entire time are also its branches. And that the vines of the sink also come from the world tree as do the thorns of the tangle, as does the canopy of the thrash, as does every single tree in the entire wild sea. The verdancy isn't just clumps of vegetation grouped next to each other, it's all the same tree. Tianmu, the heart of the wild sea. You are so far down that you can see the soil, the actual bottom of the world, rising up next to the roots, black and rich and pliant soil, as dark as the loam of oblivion whence everything sprung. The world tree's roots are thousands of feet wide, miles and miles long, countless fathoms deep, curling into the earth. They are wrinkled and risen and interlocked with each other like an old god's fingers with gaps the size of mountain chasms. From your vantage point, all of you see a particular form shaped by the contours of Tianmu's roots. It's a face. Yes, a face. The roots of the wild sea. The roots of the world tree form a visage, not of a person, but a dragon. A leviathan. You see a massive closed eye there, a nostril here, the bark-ridden lines of a sleeping jaw half buried in soil. And then it hits you. All of you. All at once. The wild sea isn't just a plane or a place. It is also a creature, which is also an object, which is also a home. Tianmu, the world tree, is the wild sea. Amarjan, this is your destiny. That bright, urgent feeling in your chest bids you to look down. And you see nestled several hundred feet below you. So simple and humble and plain that everyone else in your party except Sing missed it. It's a stone bowl. The bowl is of a normal size relative to yourself, of course, about a foot wide, half a foot deep. It's nestled in the crook of one of Tianmu's eyes, and you know instantly what it is and what you need to do. It's an offering bowl. This is your third and final trial. How do you move toward your fate? I look back at everyone. Wait here. You can see me. It'll be fine. Uh, and I start making my way down. And I'm thinking about... What, what could it want? What does... What does one give the world? By the time I get by the time I get down there, I think I know. Mm. Amarjan, the other scions do not let you go down alone. Even as you tell everyone else to stay and you start to navigate your way down this trunk, a bossy steps up beside you. Hold on. You've got a weird feeling in your chest too, right? Yes. Suhyun and I are feeling it as well. I think 
I think we're supposed to go down there together. The three of us. Then I am glad, because I was actually very afraid. I just didn't want those outsiders to know. <laughs> That's only the second time you've ever admitted you were scared to me. Well, Remember the first? Right after you told me you loved me? Yeah. I do. And I will tell you what I told you back then. When we were 16. And Abasi reaches forward and interlocks her fingers with yours. You and me. Till the end. And I put my head, like, against her chest. Please stop telling people I'm your nemesis. It's very weird. It's just, I feel, okay, up until this point, I just felt weird and it felt embarrassing to claim you know that maybe we were just i look and back embarrassing no 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 not like that just for me i've just never you know i i and then suhyeon pops up between the two of you how did they get there we don't know but they're there and suhyeon i'm here too yes, i'm also I, involved i know suhyeon i have not forgotten you I, I promise i just somebody was saying that they were embarrassed and i think we both should hear the, hear her out don't you i just mean being in uh, love is emb is embarrassing. Okay, it's it's vulnerable and it's the scariest this is, thing. I kiss I've... Rossi. This, I kiss, I kiss oh. Rossi. <laughs> Let's go. And I. Uh, so I bro. Let's go. <laughs> I look. I look back at them. That's the first time you've said it. You know. No way. Really. Suhan. That is the first time you've said it, Abasi. I have photographic memory. I- I know, I- <sighs> And she leans in and kisses you again. All right, well... Let's go save the world, shall we? And I, like, put my, like, arms out for both of them. <laughs> And arm in arm, hand in hand, step by step, the three scions together navigate the tangled branches and massive building-wide slivers of bark down the trunk of Tianmu, all the way down to the roots until your feet touch upon soil. Soil that hasn't known mortal footsteps since since the day the loam rose from the jaws of destruction. And you begin to approach this bowl. As the three scions navigate closer to the bowl, up on the branch, it's just Strike Team Nova and the Baron that remain. The Baron kind of peers down with interlocked fingers, his head cocked to one side, a look of ardent interest burning in his pale gaze. As the Scions all approach their destiny, Nova, how are you responding to this? Zynan hasn't taken his eyes off the Baron. All the wonderful things happening, he looks at the Baron and all he can think, like a jackhammer ringing in his head, is oblivion, 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 oblivion and his hand rests inside of his clothes, ready to unleash fury on that name. Hmm. What about you, Lumira? Weirdly enough, I think Lumira is in the same bracket to an extent. extent. She has not taken her eyes off the Baron either. And I think, weirdly enough, around the same time Zynan is reaching into his coat, she is subtly digging down into her boot to her right thigh where her dagger is. And she's flitting with her grip across the hilt of this dagger. Not 
breathing hard, not flinching eyes. Again, that surgical sight trained directly on the Baron. And if you look a little bit closely, it's more specifically pointed to their jugular. Like her eyes are directly on the target. If there was a bullseye, that's where she's looking dead center. Hmm. And what about you, Sayer? Sayer's eyes flit over to Abasi and Abergen's kiss love the coming together and something blooms within his soul of happiness of pride but before it is even allowed to blossom something consumes it rows of teeth rounding up near his heart and just consumes that feeling that warmth leaving only heat and emptiness in its place a writhing a coiling he is so uncomfortable he is waiting for the shoot to drop he is waiting for the quarry to reveal itself for the omen to be realized so that he can finally this finally end this and there are moments where it looks like he wants to say something, tell someone, but he can't. It's not time yet. So he stands and he stares, begging for release. Sing's eyes, your twin's eyes, were trained on you for most of this sayer. Her brow this entire journey down to the bottom of the world nodded in concern over her brother. But now, as the Scions approach their fate, she can't help herself. She has to. Sing tears her gaze away from her brother and looks at this moment of destiny coming to its foretold end. And we pan down to the Scions. Step by step by step, as the three of you approach this bowl, which is nestled on the crook of a root, only a couple feet above your heads, all three of you begin to glow. You specifically, Amargin, your tattoos glow, a bright storm electric blue. And this blue also resonates from Suhyon's eyes and their shoulders, and it resonates from Abasi's gauntlets and in the bottom of her throat pouring out from that font of strength. <laughs> Whoa! You getting this? Yes, my dear, please calm down. Calm down? <laughs> Listen, when they write about this, do you want to be written as someone who is laughing and giggling? We have to Yeah? <sighs> oh, sky above, I do love you. This is very cool. And the blue on my eyes and on my skin, it's drawing me closer to that bowl. And Omergen, you feel it too. As you get closer and closer to the offering bowl, it comes to you as clear as a sky after storm abates, what it is that Mu seeks from each of their scions. A small, genuine token of home. That's all the Wild Sea has ever asked. That's all the Wild Sea ever wants. Home. Love. Community. What offering do you put forth inside that bowl? Amargen travels very, very, very lightly. Um, but she slips off the, like, like, half cloak thing that she wears. Um, so all that's left is, like, the, like, wrapping that she uses, like, a bra, essentially. Um, but she slips that off and, like, folds it up very neatly. Um, and offers that. It is the, it's, like, 
it's like a it's like the favorite shirt sort of thing like it's not the nicest thing she owns it's not like the finest uh material that's been made for her as a princess but it is her favorite thing it's like the it, she wore it on this journey because she would remind her of home the whole way hmm. you take off this shawl which reminds you of home which smells like home and you place it in the bowl you drape it and Su Hyun steps forward and reaches into the folds of their robe and they pull out a lovingly worn wrinkled photograph and they smooth it out it's only about the size of their palm and you recognize their late father on that photograph and they place it lovingly inside the caress of that bowl and Abasi steps forward looks down at her gauntlet and then reaches into a pouch at her side and pulls out a gem a gem embedded with three different colors as well as the carving of a feather shape the three colors reminding her of each of her three parrots and she places that feather shaped gem inside that bowl and as all three offerings are placed within that shrine all three of you scions feel it this feels right this feels true Amarjan, this feels like stepping into who you were always meant to be and who you've always been and the glowing gets brighter and brighter and brighter and then the baron steps forward he steps off of the branch that he was on but he doesn't fall he floats there and he gently slowly elegantly almost like a piece of ash drifting down toward the ground begins to levitate toward this dark loam and as he does he raises a pale wrinkled hand flattening his palm like the edge of a knife and then squeezes his fingers into a fist and that stone bowl that offering basin that humble shrine at the bottom of the wild sea shudders and then it crumbles into ash. The Baron gestures to the side and stepping out from the shadows between roots, ducking her head under a mossy overhang is Igni. Oil slick darkness clings to her body, shielding her presence from your party until this very moment. Before the Baron speaks, Igni's blood-red eyes cut over to Amarjan. Sorry about this, princess. I truly am. But this is the only way I can redeem myself. Redeem the world. And then the Baron talks. The Wild Sea does not give life. It takes it. We have forgotten we are before the verdant sea this world was a realm of oil ash and flame buildings made of steel and glass ships that sailed upon hard oceans of cement and tar all was gold all was power all was glory the barons of this world ruled Aregnus, named in honor of the god that ate the green. But they were weak. A whisper of the verdancy was reborn, planted into the tar by far-traveled hands. And it crushed them. It crushed their empire. I am not enticed by such fallible pleasures as harmony with nature or ancestral guidance. The roots ensnare us, the Kreserin burns us, the verdancy consumes us. The roots emerge, the leaves have thorns, the trees explode from brackish soil. The green tide breaks our homes and lives. The earth wells gold with amber sap. To the mountains, to the peaks, 
to the sky where green can't reach. Our home is gone, is gone, is gone. The verdancy consumes it all. This is not living. There is too much tragedy in this world. Wouldn't you agree, Igni? But we can fix it. We don't need to honor the Wild Sea. What we need to do is burn it to the ground. Overpower it. And I can. I still worship the old god, Aragnus, as he is meant to be worshipped. The god who ate the green. Oil, ash, flame. My lineage has long sought the key to destroying the Wild Sea forever so that it might never return. And I, I have found it. After years, centuries of guiding my ashen to plumb the depths of the Verdancy for ancient secrets, I discovered the truth. The Wild Sea lives not just as a place, but as a god, as did Aragnus. And our beloved Scion of Heart is directly connected to the Wild Sea itself. Only she could find the heart for us, and her fate is bound to the fate of the Wild Sea. But unlike the Wild Sea, Amergen is mortal. If she burns, if she burns here, all the verdancy burns with her, from oil to flame to ash, until nothing remains as Aragnus decrees. I am here to free us all to end this cycle of death and life and declare the whole world ash. And then a look of genuine compassion. It will be better this way. I promise. And then the Baron turns to you, Sayer. And his pale eyes are alight with fervor, excitement as he reaches a hand up at you. Come, Omen Speaker. You know what must be done. <laughs> <laughs> and the clawing is violent inside him. It is writhing and thrashing, and Sayer writhes and thrashes as soon as the Baron points over to him. <sighs> the oil, the ash, the flame, it's coming! It's coming! Sayer looks towards Zynan. It's a here. terrible, a terrible feeling, Zaiden, Lumira, Sing, Amarjan, Suhyon, Abasi, is dropping in each of your souls like the world is bottoming out from beneath your feet. It's spreading through all of you, a horrible dawning moment as this is sinking in. Sing, her eyes widen. The pink subsumes the jagged edge of her iris. Finally, she rounds on you still clutching her glowing longsword, trembling once in her hand. What? <laughs> Sayer, what is he talking about? What are you talking about? What's going on? And Sayer hears it again, that jagged edge of blame, of guilt. Not that he carried and did his duty every moment and every second of this mission. Not that he put his own body and soul on the line for the Wild Sea and strikes Team Nova. And he looks over at Sig and he goes, How dare you? Not you. Not you. Look at me this way. I did what all of you asked me to do. Bear my flame for us. To follow the quarry to its end. Looks over no. at Zion and to find it, to give it chase, to hunt it down. I did it. I imprisoned it in me so that we can end this. End this now. All of us, I have done my duty as I always have. 
Sayer. Sayer steps closer to Sayer. And that weight brought by destiny is also smothered by guilt by the words that Seer says back to him and Zynan reaches a hand out to him. Now use it. But use it for the right reasons. Stay with me. Right reasons, right since I, I see the way you all look at me. Look at how you're all looking at me. Be by Sig's side. I can't be my own self. I can't support Sing. I can't stand and shout in her shadow. I can't. I am a monster. I am a millstone. I am all of these things. All of these things. Oh, no. No, Sayer, what are you? No, no, you're not. Nobody asked you to carry this darkness all by yourself, Zaiden. He's brought this thing right to the heart of this world. This isn't right. Sayer, this isn't right. And Sayer, as Sing, your sister, is telling you this isn't right, this isn't right, you hear that voice coiling up against your ear, that crimson arterial voice go, It is time, Hunter. It is time. She does not see your power, your glory. You know what must be done. <laughs> when has anything I've ever done be right? She's the never trusted one. you. The They've never understood fast. you. They'll the abandon you again. I be quiet, say it, don't do this, say it, be quiet. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. Say it. I will kill you. And then Oregnus explodes out of you. And a world made of leaves erupts into flame. And we're going to end the session there. So we will be back next week with the continuation of this story. See you all then at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Twitch at Transplanar RPG. I have been your game master and creative producer, Connie Chong. My pronouns are they, he and she. You can find me across the internet at by Connie Chong, B-Y-C-O-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G, namely Twitter and TikTok. I'm going to pass things over to our lovely guest, Austin. Hey, what's up? I'm Austin Taylor. My pronouns are he, they, she. I just got done playing Amagen, whose pronouns are she, they. Uh, I came here to be a guest and then Connie set my world on fire. <laughs> so, you know what? I'm just a guest. You Y'all have to keep dealing with this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to pass things over to uh, to uh, Johnny Flame Valley Dorian. <laughs> Not Johnny Flame, but hello, everybody. I am Valiant fire shall win dorian i use he him his pronouns you can find me all around the internet at valley and dorian right also spirit bear please enjoy that lovely treasure i just set you on and tonight i played your tormented tortured abandoned twin sayer uses he they pronouns passing it over to kai thanks baby <laughs> oh y'all hi i'm kai uh, I use he, they, and she pronouns. You can find me everywhere as Estelle of Imladris. Um, and back here, apparently in this exact spot, still probably screaming in a week as Mr. Zanin Esh. <sighs> Hi, Sam. Uh, yep. You, you go. Sam's dissociating, folks. Sam has tapped out. We lost fair. <laughs> I'm Sam. Um, I played Lumira, she, her. I use she, they, and fey pronouns every once in a while. Find me on the internet. You can find my link in the chat. Connie. It's me, Connie. Uh, so we'll be back next week at 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. Uh, for the second to last episode of Arc 1. So tell your friends, uh, tell your family, tell your dog, your cat, your para, Keith. Uh, it's gonna be a good time. We're gonna raid someone really awesome right now, no doubt. So use the raid message in chat. And yeah, we have two episodes left and it's, it's gonna be a time. 
And we would love to see you in the stream. And with that, we love you so much. Bijou, Bijou.